Hello, everyone. My name is Lionel Sandner from Pembroke Publishers, and thanks for joining us this evening for our session on research informed literacy instruction with Dr. Robin Bright, Elspeth Ray, and Heather Wilms. Uh, just before we get started, i uh, just uh, like you to know that tonight's session is presented by Orca Book Publishers and Pembroke Publishers as a co-presentation, and we're really glad to have you here joining us. I'd also like you to know that uh, Pembroke Publishers' head office is situated upon traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of Scugog, Hiawatha First Nation, Alderville First Nation, and the Métis Nation. And the treaty covering this area of land in Toronto, Ontario, is collectively known as the Williams Treaties of 1923. I would also like to acknowledge both Orca Book Publishers and myself live and work within the traditional territories of the Lagwanquin, the Malahat, Pachidat, Chuina, Sauk, and the Wasanic peoples. I wish to recognize the significant contributions of Indigenous peoples across this land. We seek a new relationship with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, one based in honour and deep respect. And just to uh, to give you a sense of our, our how we're going to uh, proceed today, we're going to give each of our speakers about 12 minutes or so to talk a little bit about an area of interest to them. And then we'll have time at the end to say uh, for any questions and discussion. And so if you do have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat. I'll be monitoring that and it would be my pleasure to bring it forward to the panel at the end. Uh, and uh, and again, if you do have any technical issues, just drop an at Lionel into the chat and I'll be glad to help you uh, as well. So with that, I'm just going to do a little technical uh, razz razzle-dazzle here and uh, bring up our first set of slides. And it is my honor to, uh, to introduce our first speaker here to tonight. And uh, that is Dr. Robin Bright. And there we go. Oh, someone's got a cat. Is that some? Is that your cat? Someone's cat there is is joining us. So that's great. So yeah. So uh, so first up is Dr. Robin Bright. Uh, Rob, Robin is is at the University of Lethbridge, and uh, and she believes that strong literacy programs provide explicit instruction and key reading skills while building a motivational and supportive classroom environment. In her newest book, which I'm sure she might reference a little bit here today, Sometimes Reading is Hard, she, she builds educators' knowledge uh, about how reading develops with emphasis on the National Reading Panel's report and recommendations for educators to provide instruction in phonemic awareness, phonics knowledge, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension in their literacy programs. I've had the, the pleasure of listening to Robin multiple times and uh, the passion that she brings to her work. I suspect uh, we are going to capture today, Robin, but also what you do for the university and for Canada with all your work. Thank you so much for everything. And I pass the virtual mic over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And good afternoon and evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Um, I know that we all share something in common, and that's the belief that reading is a critical part of our lives. And it's our goal to ensure that all of our students learn to read. So specifically today, the focus is going to be on how to help emergent readers become confident readers. So with this first slide, um, I'd like to start by saying that I fully support teachers as the instructional decision makers in their classrooms. And this term was developed by uh, researcher Marilyn Cochran Smith, who I think you might be uh, familiar with, who distinguishes the terms uh, instructional decision maker and curriculum implementer. The first term encompasses expertise and trust, and that's important for teachers to embrace. This stance is based on the very strong relationship between knowing more and teaching better. So when teachers are viewed as instructional decision makers, the day-to-day -day and minute-by-minute experiences with students count. 
So I'd like to begin by letting you know that I, like my fellow panel members here today, advocate for research-based literacy instruction. So what does that mean and how can it help you in your practice? Right now, I think everyone's really familiar that the term science of reading is front and center across North America and beyond, and rightfully so. Um, however, we have to know what is meant by that. And that's what I really hope to shed a little bit of light on today. So for researchers like me, uh, like someone like Timothy Shanahan, it means using an approach and strategies in our instruction that have been tried and through rigorous study found to be effective. We call that instructional evaluation. Again, this means that our instructional approaches and our strategies should reflect research that considers how and what it is that we teach. That's the first point on the slide. The second point refers to research findings about emergent reading instruction, which is that systematic phonics and phonemic instruction is important in improving student learning. And this finding will be explored a little bit further in the next two presentations. And there's more. If we agree that teachers can and should be the instructional decision makers in the classroom, we have to be able to answer the question, what does their or our research-based instruction look like? So you can see on the screen a diagram that I'm sure you're familiar with. It's the tiered approach to intervention uh, developed by Vaughn and Fuchs and supported through multiple studies, including research conducted by my friend and colleague who's here today from the University of Lethbridge, Dr. Chris Matatal. So I'm going to focus on tier one, which is where the bulk of a teacher's instructional time with beginning reading rests. Our instruction and in, in tier one depends on teachers having a solid foundation in how teaching reading happens in order to provide really good instruction to all students. Tier one depends on a number of things. It depends on teacher knowledge. It depends on sufficient instructional time when the teacher is teaching, not assigning, teaching reading. And it depends on a daily commitment to meet the literacy needs of students. And a, one example I can um, recall very, very vividly from my own teaching is when a grade one student ran into the classroom right after recess and said, Mrs. Bright, Mrs. Bright, I ran all through research, or, or all through recess. And I said, did you? Let's write that up on the board. And so we wrote, re, you know, that the student's name runned all through recess. And then I said, there's another way to say, it. use the word run. We could say, and we put the student's name there, the student ran all through recess. And we read both sentences. We looked at how the word run was different from the word ran. And then I asked the student, which one sounds better? And they said, the one that says I ran all through recess. That's what it means to show a commitment to literacy every single minute of the day. So in order to provide this kind of worthwhile tier one instruction to all students, we first have to divest ourselves of some of the ways in which we've been taught to think. And my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Leah Fowler says it's best, says it best when she says, it means not believing everything we think. So what are some of those maybe unhelpful ways of thinking that might work against using research informed practices? Well, one is, I've always taught this way. Another one is, I'm using this program because the school division bought it for us. Another is, I'm doing it because others are doing it. And finally, it just feels right and it seems to work for most of my students. Interestingly, many of those ways of thinking actually undermine the teacher's ability to be the instructional decision maker in the classroom. 
So what we want to be able to say is I'm doing this or I'm using this because research shows it helps children learn. And that's, of course, why you're here. Engaging in professional learning can make a difference to your practice. Now, of course, you know and I know that even with excellent tier one instruction, all children do not make the same progress. And that's when we move to tier two, which provides more opportunities for children who need it. Notice I said, for children who need it. Not everyone. When a child has learned a skill, move that child on. And I only add that here because Mark Seidenberg recently fielded a question from a teacher who asked, if a student is a good reader, do we need to continue with phonemic awareness instruction? And his response is important. He says, instruction in subskills like phonemic awareness is important to the extent it advances the goal of reading. The goal is reading, not phonemic awareness. So for that student, precious instructional time can be lost and it would be much more helpful to focus on those many other things as well that need to be learned to be a skillful reader. So tier two instruction occurs uh, just very quickly in small groups. It's focused on skills that need to be worked on and it provides what I love to call double dose instruction, right? And tier three instruction then will focus on the needs of individual students who are continuing to experience um, significant problems in learning to read with more intensive interventions being used, perhaps outside of the classroom as well, and oftentimes will require uh, more testing and screening uh, for those students to progress. Okay, so what does research say is worth paying attention to in our reading instruction? Instruction must provide attention to all the components of learning of reading. And these five components plus writing uh, were identified by the National Reading Panel in 2000 as essential to reading instruction in kindergarten through to grade 12. Um, many of you will know that the review uh, and the report uh, that came out of the review examined hundreds and hundreds of studies in order to identify what's effective in teaching reading. And there's a huge body of literature devoted to each one of these components. And it's it's a lot to sort through. And it certainly took a lot of my time uh, during my study leave in order to bring those results forward in, uh, in my book, Sometimes uh, Reading is Hard. So that's good uh, tier one reading instruction by focusing on phonemic awareness and phonics knowledge, but those things only matter if they lead us into working on fluency with kids and fluency instruction only matters if it leads us to vocabulary instruction and knowledge. And of course that matters because it leads us to comprehension. And P. David Pearson famously said, and that leads to critical understanding and action in the world, which is of course what we are what we're working towards. So I'll share one of the my, you know, sort of my, one of my findings in the last slide about a particular strategy that teachers can use that will help um, help you see how all of the components can work together. So sometimes teachers are going to teach um, some of these components separately and they're going to work on those, um, but sometimes you're going to be teaching more than one at, at a time. And I want to just add here that Shanahan and others contend that the National Reading Panel components are a part of science of reading. So already, I think we're we're um, coming to an understanding that uh, the science of reading can be an expansive uh, type of um, idea. And next, I just want to um, ensure that we acknowledge that a great deal of research has been done since the National Reading Panel's work in 2000 over the last uh, two decades, and that the the importance that not only of these key components but new findings that have really expanded what we know should be included in the science of reading. 
So on this slide, I just want to make sure that I identify uh, those other topics that have generated large bodies of research as well and should be included in our understanding of science of reading. These are motivation for reading, writing and spelling to improve reading, oral language, the, the importance of oral language, text complexity, teaching reading comprehension in other subjects, like science and social studies, differentiation, quality of instruction, and text structure. So those are just some of the other topics that have emerged over the past two decades, um, whose findings we also need to include in um, an understanding of what matters in teaching reading. And finally, I'd like to present a teaching strategy uh, supported in the research literature literature as one effective way to teach reading um, and of course it's shared reading and many people will will be familiar with this as a teaching strategy but I want to point out that all not all shared reading experiences are created equal so there are some things that teachers really can be aware of um, that will make sure that this is an effective use of, of this particular strategy. So I'm going to talk about a lovely book called Hattie and the Fox by Mem, uh, Mem Fox that's often used in um, elementary classrooms and how it might be used as a big book experience. Um, it, what really matters here is uh, I'm talking about using this book over several days as opposed to trying to fit all of this instruction into one particular session with the book. Um, and each day, what's important is that the teacher sets a goal for that day. So on day one, uh, the focus is on comprehending the story. On day two, the goal could be teaching a decoding skill. And if you know this book, it would probably be uh, the double E, long E sound, as in the word sheep. Uh, day three, uh, the goal could be uh, vocabulary knowledge. On um, day four, the goal could relate to fluency development. And then day five, the goal could be to create an oral or a written response to the story, which would provide experiences with writing and spelling. And that, in a nutshell, is an introduction to good tier one reading instruction uh, that's informed by research. And I look forward to hearing more from my fellow panel members now about instruction specifically uh, designed for increasing children's knowledge in decoding. Thank you. Great, thanks Robin. Okay, the toughest part I just realized of this whole panel is not asking you questions right now based on what you said, but we're gonna hold that to the end and uh, I suspect there'll be a few thoughts, but thank you very much for, uh, for getting us started there. And uh, next we're going to move on to Heather Wilms. And for those of you that have not had the pleasure of meeting Heather, she is a district reading intervention teacher whose work includes uh, mentoring, modeling, and supporting both teachers and students in grades K through to seven. She has more than 20 years of experience in the classroom, learning support, and as a district lead teacher. She, she is a respected literacy leader. She works as, also works as a university sessional instructor, reading consultant, and coach for district schools and teachers interested in shifting instruction to align uh, with the science of reading. I also know she has a new book out and she's busy uh, talking about that to, to folks and uh, providing uh, support around the area of science of reading. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to the next few minutes of having uh, Heather, Heather join us and talk a little bit about, uh, about her area of interest. Heather? Okay, thank you, Lionel. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to be here. I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about um, implementing phonics instruction. And um, of course, that's a very big topic, but we're going to just touch on a few important points um, this evening. So uh, when we look at the instruction with our students, there's some things that um, we want to keep in mind. So for maximum academic gains, students need systematic, explicit, engaging, and success-orientated instruction. So what does that mean? What does that look like for us? Well, we want to be systematic. Um, a teacher would use, when we're, when we're teaching phonics, we want to have a specific scope and sequence for introducing um, each of the skills that we're going to introduce to our students and teach. 
We want to be explicit and provide clear instruction in what that skill is and um, the knowledge that students uh, need to engage with that skill. It needs to be engaging. And I know Robin mentioned this already and so important. I just feel like as instructors, that's just a huge part of our role is to um, really um, hook our students into this very exciting um, piece of learning to read. And then finally, we wanna minimize errors and provide immediate corrective feedback when errors occur with what we're teaching them because um, we don't want students to be practicing things incorrectly and then um, having that uh, as their pattern. So we're just, um, there's two pieces I wanna talk about today. I wanna to talk a little bit about scope and sequence and then I wanna talk a little bit about evidence-based practices. So um, one of the things that's, that's really helpful when we teach phonics is that we have a scope and sequence for learning um, all the components of how English is put together. And I always um, think that when we're talking about phonics, we're really doing linguistic work. How does this English language work? And we wanna teach that to our students. We know that there's not one clear scope and sequence. This is the one that research um, tells us we must use. But there are some concepts that are built on other concepts. And so we want to make sure that our students have foundational work before we move on to more complex skills. So we usually start with our short vowel sounds, our letters and sounds, uh, and then we move on to um, long vowel, vowel, vowel teams. But there's some flex in that. For example, you might learn letters and sounds, but then you could decide, I'm going to teach digraphs, two letters that make one sound, like SH says shh. I'm going to teach that next because those two letters make one sound, just like single letters make one sound. And the next person might say, you know what, after letters and sounds, I'm going to teach blends because students already know those sounds, so I'm going to do blends. Neither of those approaches is incorrect. We just need to make sure that we teach both. However, when we get into more complex concepts, it's really helpful um, to know what foundational skills they're built on so that our students are ready for that work. We also need to really keep in mind who's in front of us. So if I have a scope and sequence that I like or my uh, team members, I'm working with my team members, I want to screen my students to see where they're at. I don't want to spend a lot of time on skills they already know, but I also might need to go back and fill in a few gaps of things that my students are a little bit unsure of. So, you know, no matter what scope and sequence or learning progression we're working with, it's all about who's in front of us and helping those students um, move forward in their learning journey. And then when we have a scope and sequence, we don't want to cherry pick the scope and sequence and go, I'm, I feel like doing long vowel OA today, or I feel like doing this piece. Um, we want to make sure that um, we teach the, you know, all of the concepts that we have within our scope and sequence. The other thing I wanted to touch on today was evidence-based practices. So um, we are living in very complex times as educators. Our students in front of us have changed in the last 20, 25 years. And so as we spend time with our students and look at um, instruction in reading for them, we really want to choose the activities that are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. And Robin already referenced this um, in her pr presentation is that, yeah, there's lots of ways that we can work with our students to teach them concepts and move them forward, but we want to use the ones that are going to really, we're going to get the most mileage out of. Robin also talked about being as informed as possible. It really, I, you know, I scroll through social media and I find it overwhelming the amount of strategies and materials and tools um, that are offered to us as educators. And we're very passionate about um, supporting our students. So how do we know which are the things that we want to use? They might even fit in our scope and sequence, but how do we know what's going to um, be the most helpful. And so what if we are very informed about how children learn to read and the things that help them to move forward, then we can be much more um, discerning about what we choose to bring into our classroom. 
We also want to look for activities where students are manipulating letters and sounds. So um, in our book, there's a chapter on evidence-based strategies, and you start looking at that chapter and you're like, oh, I see some repetition here. We're working on the same skills, but they're um, presented in different ways so that our students get lots of practice. So what do I mean by manipulating? Well, let's say that we're gonna build some words, which is really good practice for our students. So the word is tin. So how many sounds in tin? T, I, n, there's three. First sound, t, and I'm gonna hold these up because my whiteboard sort of blacks out on me. First sound is t, t, I. I always go back for our students who need review. So I wouldn't go t and then I, I, but I'm gonna go t, I. Next sound is, I, so we got T, and then the next one, T, I, N. Our next sound is N, tin. Okay, so that's good work. What are the sounds? We talked about phonemic awareness. What are the sounds, and then what letters represent those sounds, which really is what phonics is all about. So we have tin. Instead of building a new word, we could start manipulating the words, the, the sounds in this word. So we want maybe to ask our students for pin. So we're going to go, which is the one that we need to manipulate. Oh, it's that first one, the T. We're going to take that out and we're going to add, and we're going to check it, pin. So that manipulation piece, that's where the money is. And there's lots of ways we can do that work with our students. We can have them writing the words on a whiteboard and erasing them and then writing in the new um, letter for the new sound. Students um, are become very familiar with the first sound in a word first. So we, for our emergent readers, we might always be manipulating that first sound. And then we start manipulating the last sound. So it might be the word is pin. Now we want to change it to pit. It. Some of our struggling readers will go pit. Oh, it's this one. Yes, it's this one. And we take that out. And then we would add a T to that. And then finally, our last one that we want to manipulate is that medial sound. That's the hardest one for emergent readers to hear. So when we're manipulating letters and sounds, we're really working with the sounds of language and the letters that represent them, and we get phenomenal mileage um, out of those kind of activities. And then the last um, thing I wanted to mention, which um, aligns with that, is that, that you know, we want to provide our children with multiple opportunities and activities to practice the concepts being taught. So I always think of, you know, I'm going to model it as a teacher. I do. And then we do. We're going to do it together. And then our students, you do. They're going to do it. And I'm going to be looking. Do they have it? Are they struggling? Who's still struggling? If lots of them are struggling, it's going to come back to we do again. And we do. And we do. And then off they go to you do. And then most of them have it. But a few don't. Then they're going to need that small group work to continue. Um, to practice those skills. But we want to do this in a very engaging way. I know um, some of you have seen me do like giant letter cards. I have a magic wand for magic E. There's just lots of engaging ways for our students to um, play with letters and sounds and to um, learn the structure of the English language, which is so fascinating to many students. Sometimes I teach in the adults in the back of the room even go, Oh, that's how that works, because we've intuitively learned those patterns, but our students have the privilege of being explicitly taught them. So I'm going to hand it actually back to Lionel, but one of the great strategies for phonics instruction is practicing it in text, and we're going to hear from Elizabeth, who's going to talk about decodable books, which is exciting. Great, thank you, Heather. Well, uh, there's again a couple questions sort of floating there, but we will wait to the end uh, for that. So I appreciate you uh, being able to to get the, the letters up, and I don't know how you were able. I guess it's practice to hold all three. That's that's uh, that's one of the the pieces of practice. 
benefits of coming. My superpower, from yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> great, great. Thank you very much. Um, and so next, uh, I noticed uh, Elspeth that uh, Margaret was referring to Team Orca, and I, I didn't mention at the beginning, but our both Robin and Heather are Pembroke authors, and uh, Elspeth is our, our, our Orca author. So I guess Team Orca is is that is part of the introduction um but now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce elspeth ray uh she is in the classroom as we speak uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, so you know she has the the time and the experience to use many different types of practice materials including as heather mentioned decodable books as she works with students who are learning to read and develop literacy skills. And today she will be showing some examples from her classroom, but also from her books, uh, Megan Gregg, who are, uh, she co-authors with Rowena Ray, who is on there quietly uh, listening. And you may recognize the same last names and, and see the connection there. Uh, but she'll be describing what, de describing what decodable means and how to choose and use decodable books with your students. So Elspeth, it's great to have you join us and I'll pass the virtual mic over to you. Thank you, Lionel. And um, hello, everybody. It's nice to speak to you from very, very rainy Vancouver. Um, as Lionel says, my name is Elspeth. And as Heather says, I'm going to follow along from Heather's comment about um, the importance of allowing students multiple opportunities and multiple activities to practice the concepts that they're being taught. So the one particular activity that I'm going to highlight is reading of decodable books or decodable text. So I am passionate about this area because I use decodable text every day in the classrooms that I teach in, and I see their success every day with the children that I work with um, at all sorts of different levels of the spectrum. Um, and I'm also the co-author of, of the decodable book series, Megan Gregg, with my sister, Rowena, who is watching. <laughs> so let's begin. Um, what is a decodable book? A decodable, decodable books are simple books that are written for beginning readers. Decodable books only use the words that contain the specific letters and sounds your student has learned so far. Many people think that decodable books are only very, very simple CVC type books, CVC words. But in fact, the more your students learn, the more advanced books they can read. And as long as the book doesn't contain any letter sound correspondences or concepts that your students haven't learned yet, then it is decodable to them, and it doesn't matter how advanced it gets. Importantly, decodable books are for students to practice reading. They're not meant for adults to read to children. To start with, you may have your students read aloud to you, or you might send the books home for the students to read with their parents. And when they're confident enough, the students are going to be able to read the decodable books to themselves. Decodable books provide beginning readers with the opportunity to practice the letter sound sorry, sounding out and blending sounds together to make real words. And it also gives students the opportunity to gain confidence because they're only being presented with letters and sounds that they're already learning or have learned. And so therefore they're likely to find success. Decodable books encourage children to use their knowledge of letter sound correspondences to sound out words rather than other strategies like looking at the picture or looking at the first letter of a word and making a guess. Once students get into the habit of using sounding out strategies, then they're less likely to start using some of the less effective strategies like guessing. So for example, if your students have learned only the letters S, M, and short A, then you would be able to choose a book like the one in the top left-hand corner, I Am Sam, which only uses those three letters um, in addition to the letter I, and I'm going to come to that in a second. Um, when they've learned a little bit, a few more letter sound correspondences, then you could move them on to something else. For example, if they've learned all the consonant sounds and all the short vowels, and they've moved on to the digraphs, let's say they've just done SH, then you might choose the second story in our Megan Gregg book one, which is called Swish the Pet Fish, which focuses on SH. When they've learned the R controlled vowel AR, they might choose, you can see on the right top right hand corner, Car Sparks by Nora Gainos. And when they've mastered the double O making the OO sound, you might choose Goose on the Loose by Osborne Books. So as they progress, you're able to choose more and more um, books with more and more content. Ideally, the decodable book that you choose should be, should be cumulative. 
so that the students get practice with the skills they already have, as well as practice whatever their newest skill is. The goal is to try and find a decodable book that is just at the right level for the material you've taught your students so far. And this can sometimes be hard because as Heather pointed out, there's lots of different scopes and sequences and there's no perfect one. There's no absolute right one. So it may be that the writers of the decodable books that you're looking at have not followed the exact same order that you're using in your classroom. Um, but luckily on the inside cover of most books, I'm looking on the left-hand side of the slide here, the white slide, um, usually it tells you what is included in the book. It usually lets you know what your student is expected to know before they pick up the book. So that's a very useful place to have a look at, usually on the inside cover or the back cover. Now, not all words are decodable. Decodable means that with the skills your student has, they can decode the words on the page. Therefore, decodable books shouldn't really include any words that can't be figured out even with extensive instruction. English does have words from other languages, as we all know, and it also has words that have unexpected spellings, usually due to a complicated history, but those words are generally avoided altogether in decodable books. I'm thinking of words like kayak, which comes to us from Danish, or beautiful, which comes through French, or the word island, which has that S in it, which we no longer pronounce. However, writing a book that is 100% decodable is practically impossible. There's always the need for a few words that may have tricky spellings, but are fundamental parts of our language. I'm thinking now of words like the or of. And most decodable books are forced to include a few of these tricky words. And on the blue, head, blue side of the slide, the top three boxes, the yellow, the red, and the green box there, all show examples of in the inside front cover or back cover of different books, um, the tricky words that are included in those books, which will give the adults a heads up um, and allow them to help the children with the students with those words when they come across them. Um, and just to point out, as you're probably looking at there, there's different ways to describe what I'm calling tricky words. Everyone, not everyone, but people call them different things. I call them tricky words. Um, some people call them red words or sight words or non-phonetic words or high frequency words, um, but all of them are, are usually genuinely tricky words. But also you might notice that there's a few that are just useful words that the author has wanted to use in the book. They may be more advanced than the scope and sequence that the book is based on, but the author wanted to use those words. In the top right-hand box there with the red ring around it, you'll see the word for, F-O-R. That is a completely decodable word if you've learned that O-R makes the OR sound, the R controlled vowel. If you haven't learned that yet, then it's not decodable for you. So for that little book, that little screenshot that I took there, that particular book that was beyond the scope and sequence of that book, so they're putting it down as a word um, that adults need to look out and help students with when they come to it. Um, one other comment is to choose your books wisely. In the, the very bottom box there, again, with a red ring, ring around it, this is from a book that I, I, I advise you not to just judge a book by its cover. It's really important that you look inside the books that you're choosing for your students, because although, of course, some authors have good intentions, like this particular book, this book was advertised as a short A book. Um, however, they've used some words that that do legitimately have the short A in them, but they have some more advanced elements that I would never expect a child who's just learning short A to be able to master. Look at the word orange. Orange does have a short A in it, that's true, but it also has OR in it, which is one of those R controlled vowels, and it has the soft G at the end of the word. Neither one of those are elements that I would expect a student to have learned and be ready to practice if I'm actually trying to get them to practice short A, which means they're probably nearer the beginning of their, their reading journey. Um, moving on. All right, and it's true to say that you might struggle to find the absolute perfect book for your student, which is why I want to point out that to get your students to practice reading with decodable stories, it doesn't mean that you have to go out and buy actual books. Decodable text can be anything from the short phrases that you see on the white side of the screen um, to a little story that maybe you've made up or you found to actual decodable readers. So please understand that to give your students practice reading, they don't have to have a book in their hands. They can read text of any length. 
Um, one complaint that some people have with decodable books is that, especially for the very beginning books, the word choice is so limited based on the letters and sounds the beginning student has learned so far that sometimes decodable books are a little bit boring and sometimes the language is a little bit unnatural. Um, a good example of that is, is the picture with the green box around it. There's a sentence there that says, it did rot, which just doesn't sound supernatural, even if, you know, it just doesn't sound natural. So while I agree that's true, I think it's important to remember that decodable books are really there to serve a purpose. And that purpose is to give students practice and to feel success with reading. I've heard decodable books called training wheels for new readers um, because they're exactly that. There's something to give to get students started, to give them confidence, but they're not going to be reading them forever. Um, there's also, also good to point out that decodable books are not the only books that your children are going to encounter in the classroom. Parents and teachers should still be reading high quality literature to their children um, with more complex vocabulary and sentence structure. And reading to children gives them the opportunity to hear good reading modeled and exposes them to higher level vocabulary and ideas and concepts, and all of that is gonna to help to support their reading development. Another thing to say is that some decodable book authors try to think of different ways to keep the story from being very basic and boring. Osborne Books uses a shared reading model um, where the adult reads one portion to keep the, keep the story interesting, and then the child reads another portion. Our Megan Gregg books use the same idea. Um, and the idea being that the adults can keep the story at a good pace, keep it interesting, and the children still get the opportunity to recognize the letter sound correspondences that that particular book targets. Finally, I just want to say a word about other books. I know that lots of classrooms are full of leveled readers, like you can see the one on the right hand side. And these tend to have repetitive text and pictures, and that helps the students to figure out what the story is about. And that's basically guessing. That's not really the same thing as reading the words on the page. So they're not super useful for students to practice applying letters, their letter sound correspondences or whatever concepts they're being taught. But books like Leveled Readers and other concept books are still interesting and they're still enjoyable for students to look at. They have value depending on how you use them. And I believe it, uh, that children should have access to a combination of decodable books and concept books. I work with a teacher who tells her students to choose some books for their heads and some books for their hearts. So we help them choose a decodable book for their heads, but we're never going to stop them from choosing the Pokemon handbook for their hearts. Thanks, Lionel. Thanks, Elizabeth. I like that last part too about head and heart. That's a, a good a good place to uh, to end because um, I think uh, all all three of you have uh, have sort of captured that. And you know, as I've been listening, it's uh, it's interesting to sort of you know you take sort of where Robin was starting us with uh, you know not believing everything we think. That's a challenge, right? Like that—that that is a really big challenge. If you know, we've been doing what we've been doing with our students for quite a while. So, and then, and you know, and the whole time, I think as any teacher does, it is head and heart. And there's some challenges, uh, you know. And you, the three of you have been very, very clear. At not only sort of talking about the, the, you know, the research, but also the practical application of that. So I just have uh, been watching and th there's not a lot of questions yet in the chat, but as you were there, I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of things that we could sit and talk for hours here and that that won't happen, but I'll just, uh, I'll just make sure that everyone's mic is on. And then maybe I'll just, uh, there are a couple questions to, to sort of see if we can kind of tie this all together a little bit here. And maybe yeah. since Robin, you started, I'll, I'll start with you uh, as well and kind of pull on again that, that uh, not believing everything we think, um, that's a big challenge, right? Because, you know, here I've been doing these things and I might have certain activities that work really well with the kids and I see it and I see that and I'm getting feedback from that, but should I be doing it? And, you know, just to pull an example out, something like reading aloud, I like to do that and the kids, the kids respond to that and, and yet, Am I? It, how do I ensure that I'm still teaching that that reading when I'm doing read alouds with my with my students? 
Yes, I know. And you, and reading aloud to children can be um, a really pleasurable kind of activity that both the teacher and the students can really enjoy. So I, I think one of the ways that you want to think of, about reading aloud to children is, you know, still still keeping in mind that this is um, valuable, you know, non-renewable instructional minutes in a day. And so how do you get the most out of them? Mm -hmm. I just uh, spoke to a grade one teacher who was asking me this exact question. And when I said to her, you know, think a little bit about the components, right? Let's think about phonemic awareness, especially in a grade one classroom, phonics, phonemic um, uh, awareness, look at the book that you're reading to them and ask yourself like read the book beforehand and find places in the book where you can you can stop you don't have to take a lot of time but where can you embed you know um reading knowledge so you might stop at a word um we use the example papyrus so that's not a uh, a word, um, right, Elspeth, that a child is going to be expected to read in grade one, um, but it might be, you know, a very pleasurable book that the teacher's sharing. And so there's a number of things that the teacher could can do. And so I suggested, for instance, ask your children, does anybody know what papyrus is? Um, provide a definition, um, indicate to them, you know, with a picture what it looks like. Um, actually say papyrus is smooth and, you know, move your hands together, create kind of a tactile experience around that word, yeah. you know, and then continue with the activity. And once I just mentioned that one um, example, she came up with three or four other things that she thought that she could do, you know, in those 10 minutes still focused on the book but really thinking about those components you know every day or every minute of the day so that's just one example yeah but even in that example you, you mentioned it, and i'm just checking my notes here again but it, it, what i really like is is that you use the term be the instructional leader mm -hmm. like that's that's keeping that professionalism and hey i'm i'm the teacher in the class and i'm the instructional leader so i've got to make those those kind of decisions that's a fair statement absolutely and and you want to look at your day in in those terms you know am i making the very good good use of every minute that i have we used to call it a long time ago time on task yeah. uh, but i i like the i like the term you know instructional minutes non renewable instructional minutes right yeah. and that really hits home for me in terms of how am i using my time with students perfect yeah good Thank you. Um, and just kind of is sort of, I think building on that a little bit, uh, it, Heather, sort of as as Robin was talking there, I was I was sort of thinking again back to your letters, and you know you were able to sort of pull those letters out, and you want kids to read those, but it seems like spelling is also kind of connected there, and I think sometimes there's kind of a I don't want to say disjoint, but I can be good at one, but maybe not as good at the other. Um, is there ways of addressing that in 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 the, in a literacy program or in all your yeah, classes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm the reading intervention teacher in my district, and sometimes I'll um, go into schools and teachers will say, "Well, I, you know, we're reading really well here," and I'm like, "That's awesome. I love that. How's the spelling?" And then they're like, oh, yeah, not so much. So I get asked a lot about spelling because when we read, we decode. We see the word on the page and we take it apart and attach sounds to it and decode the word. We want to always, when we're teaching reading and, and explicitly teaching concepts, if we're doing the um, phonics piece, is we want to decode, but we also want to encode. We want to build those words as well. And it's really a different skill because when we read, well, there's overlap, but you know, when we read, all the letters are there for us. When we spell, we have to mentally retrieve them um, in order to have it correct on the page. So uh, one of the things I tell students is, you know, if you, and this is the phonemic awareness piece, is if you have something for every sound, I can read it. Even if you use the wrong vowel team or, you know, I, I can read it. So when we're, when we're teaching our reading, our, our reading, let's say we're doing um, the concept magic E with gate, g a t you know, there's four letters there, but we want to go, what are the sounds? G, G, A, A, T. 
But then, oh, how are we going to make, it says gap. So how are we going to make that um, short A into a long A? So um, kids who are reading well and not spelling correctly, um, they may just need some work with explicit phonics so that they know that, you know, what are the sounds that make the long A? Well, the letter A, um, magic E, um, and then there's vowel teams that make the A. So sometimes that work um, is missing. And when I work with older students, we go back in and refresh and just fill in the gaps of those phonics concepts, making sure that when they're encoding, that they're making um, knowledgeable uh, decisions about what they're writing. But, you know, if yeah. we haven't taught that concept and it's not spelled correctly, we just go, yay, every sound is there. We're so happy. Yeah. And um, we just need to realize that we celebrate um, what our students can do and then we guide. And it's when it's when we haven't explicitly taught it, we do not expect it from our students. That invented spelling is a beautiful thing. And then it can also be informative for us as teachers, too, when we're seeing errors, the same error over and over that oh, I maybe need to review this so that we have now you didn't you didn't talk specifically about this, but I'm going to pull on the fact that I've heard you speak before okay. a little bit, and uh, there, there's it, it, you use the word retrieval in there, and mm. there, and there is uh, of you know those those sounds that I as a student have to learn, um, it, and you talked about scope and sequence, and I think sometimes scope and sequence people think of it as a marching set of orders, and yeah. I, I, and and I know you don't look at it that way but how do you deal with that piece you just said a second ago about older kids that mm -hmm. don't remember it so they have to retrieve it you know you have to go back and give them the experience so that they basically build that long-term memory to retrieve it is that is that right or is it is there a different way of flowing with that yeah if, you know one of the things when i go into our older school our older grade classrooms is we're still screening our students to see if there mm -hmm. might be gaps if yeah. they're already working with the learning support teacher we have that knowledge already but um, that whole role of screening and a spelling screen is a beautiful way to do that. The teacher can do it with all their students at the same time. They're not pulling them. And then they can say, oh, look, this concept is missing. And, you know, when you chart a class wide screen of spelling, I just highlight who doesn't have it. And then you look and go, oh, everybody needs magic E or everybody needs OA. And then I know that I need to address it if I have only you know, two or three students who don't have magic E, I'm going to do that work with them and I'm not going to spend time as a whole class. Right. And then, so that's getting back into Robin's tiered, three tiers. Yeah, right so very perfect. much so. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe just, I know we've got a couple minutes left and uh, it, we don't, I don't usually do this, but Anne-Marie has somehow figured out the time zones from the Philippines and uh, just a, just a quick welcome to, for joining us and thanks for coming in, Anne-Marie. That's, that is the professional dedication of, of the whole group. But I honestly don't even know what, I think it's tomorrow you're, so you're, you're actually coming to us from the future. So that's pretty cool. So thank you for, for joining us. Um, Elspeth, maybe just a, a little bit, there is a question around uh, decodables with Chris, um, but there also, but there's one there I wouldn't mind sort of getting first a, a little bit. And that being, you sort of mentioned that there's many activities and because, you know, you're, you're in the classroom, I mean, you know, and I love the books, you know, the idea of the parent and the, and the student with the decodables decodable books but i'm sure there's other activities that you see that fit in there and i don't know if you have a couple you know a minute or two just to kind of sure. share what some of those are yeah absolutely and i should probably point out that that handing a child a decodable book is is um one of the the last things that we would do after they've been taught a concept um if they've just been taught a concept giving them a whole bunch of text is is maybe a little bit overwhelming. So we do we do an awful lot of work before we eventually hand them hand them a book. Um, I have an Orton Gillingham background, so I do a lot of things with tactile um, kinesthetic. So I, I like I like doing a lot of, of um, practicing the letter sound correspondences and, and practicing the tracing the letters that correspond with the sounds, etc. in a lot of different tactile surfaces like the sand boxes and on the carpet and even just on, on their sleeves if you have them all sitting on the carpet in front of you. 
Um, we do a lot of work on mini whiteboards. Um, I, because I'm teaching a classroom full of children, it's, I, I don't like asking individual students what the answer is because that's only getting one child to come up with the answer. So the little mini whiteboards, it gets a chance for everyone to write down the sound. So with a, maybe the grade two, three class I'm working in, I might say, you know, what are all the ways we've learned to spell long A? That particular class has learned four of them and everyone jots it down on their whiteboard and, and holds it up. Yeah. So lots of lots of repetition and practice until they have until the point of automaticity. I think that Heather used that word as well. Our our goal is to work with with students until they're recalling the sounds and the letters that make those sounds automatically. And we're also talking about concepts here. Um, Magic E is a is a concept. So it's not just letter sound correspondences. It's concepts as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah. maybe I can just touch on Chris's question at the same time. Hey, can I can I just frame it just a little bit differently? Because I'm really yeah. curious about how this would fit in here. So you use the word automaticity. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of cognitive load theory and kind of what's going on with the working memory mm -hmm. and automaticity supports that. And it, it to me, it seems like decodable books are doing that as well. You know, that a novice is not an expert. So, you know, you want to make you want to make sure that the, the kid has the working memory available to start learning those concepts that you're talking about. And so, and I don't know if it's back to the instructional leader piece that Robin's talking about, but Chris is talking about this zone of proximal development, which I like, but it also, you know, if I, if I give a student a book that is too much, then, then their working memory is is overwhelmed and, and they don't know where to go. So it seems like the decodable book is trying to prevent that. But where's that where's that line of how far do you go? You know, that's well, it, maybe that's I'll pass it over. Sure. I, I think it depends on on how far the child has has, has got um, when they're very young and you're literally just introducing them to, to material for the first time. I would go for something that is highly decodable. Yeah. So that they really they're 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 going to find success and there's no, they're not going to come across too many words that they can't decode. But as they as they um, get older, eventually you're attempting to bridge them from decodable to books that that have regular text in them. Some words will be decodable to them, and some words won't be decodable. So you might you might sort of bring it from a 90% decodable book down to an 80% decodable book for that child. You know, depending on their level, and eventually you're bridging you're bridging, um, and and. To just say one little thing there about Chris's comment, he was saying about is it how is it to get to present children with new words? And I think that it's important to to point out that we don't teach words, right? We don't we don't teach children how to to, to read words. We teach them the skills to decode any word that is made up of the letters and sounds that they've learned. So if a child has learned the the letters O R, then there's no reason why they can't read any word that has an O R in it, as long as it doesn't have any other more advanced things. So it doesn't, yes, I would, I would definitely push children to read words they've never, ever heard before. In fact, I often try and get children to read words that they're unlikely to have heard before. Um, I was talking again to that grade two, three class, and we were talking about um, the little, the long O sounds. And I said, you know, I'm looking for another long O sound that tends to go at the end of a word. And I said, you know, if you wanted to spell the word stow, for example, like stow your bags in the in the overhead locker, which is not a word many children have come across or spelled. They should know how to spell stow and read stow if we've spent enough time teaching them about long O and OW making the O sound at the end of words like stow right. and snow, right. et cetera. Great. Does that make sense? Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Well, uh, can I add something there? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. No, I, lo I love this discussion. And I I, um, I think I know where, where Chris is coming with that. Um, just because, uh, you know, there's some new research that does talk about text com complexity and students being able to struggle. Um, and I, you know, I'm aware that, and not for beginning readers. So I'm, I mm -hmm. completely agree with you, Elspeth, that it's just so important for us to, you know, set the foundation. Uh, in my book, I talk about it like learning to drive <laughs> and mm -hmm. that, you know, there's a lot of things you need to know before you get into the car, but there's a lot of things you learn when you're in the car. And I think that's um, that's kind of what this research is is talking about, is that, you know, you, you give uh, students certain skills, but at some point you do want them to struggle. You do want them to learn, you know, while they're they're in that book or, or in that car. So that's all I would add to that. 
great, great. Yeah, great. and I I mentioned um, Tim Shanahan's blog on my in the handout, and he's done some really interesting blogs on that as well. That wrestling with text. So I, I was just trying to type that the handout is now available. So thank you, Heather. Uh, yeah. I know we're coming to the top of the hour, or I don't think we have anyone from Newfoundland, so it's not the bottom of the hour. So we're okay there. Uh, David's in PEI. I think that's as far east as we go. Um, but folks, you can access the handout uh, right up in the top right-hand corner next to the chat. There is a uh, handout tab, and if you click on that, you should be able to download it. I will also make sure that it's included in the email that you will receive in the next 24 hours uh, letting you know that the recording is posted if you'd like to go back to this please do share uh, this this recording with any of your colleagues if you think it would be valuable I know that both Orca books and Pembroke publishers are passionate about books and about uh, kids reading and I think you see from these three uh, amazing authors and their passion that they brought forward over the last hour uh, around reading is just examples of the fine products that are produced by both companies. So on behalf of everyone, I would uh, like to say good e thank you very much for attending. Have a good evening. And we hope to see you soon in a future webinar. And I really hope to get the three of, of you back for another longer conversation because it feels like we just got going and now we're done. So uh, uh, on behalf of everyone that's kind of coming through and saying thank you, thanks for taking the time and uh, bringing your passion for helping kids learn to read uh, forward in this session and everything else you do. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, thanks everyone. We'll see you soon.